Hi there, Tom. Hey Jude, how you doing, mate? <laughs> Very good, thanks. Uh, I'm so excited you uh, had a bit of time to join me today for a, for a Zoom call. Um, for anyone who doesn't know you, I'm sure we're going to get into your, your past and all your CV, but you're basically head of factual at Lion Pictures, which is yes. an absolutely awesome company making the best documentaries ever right now. So I couldn't be more excited for you. But okay. as much as we're going to get onto that, we started our journey with you as series producer of uh, what I might say was a landmark series of uh, was. The I Big was Life a direct, I was a series director. Oh, right. So was, yeah, yeah. So not that I'm picking holes, you know, but okay. like... <laughs> I should, I should, I should um, have read my notes. <laughs> look, um, yeah, when we, five years ago. Do we think it's five years ago? Six years ago? It is, isn't it? Yeah, goes quick. Oh, it was full on. It was landmark as well. I love it. I love it. So I thought what would be fun is that I I wanted to basically like as a, as a thin red thread for our discussion is not just to basically say how wonderful we all were um, in hindsight because at the time that the interesting bit is it was total chaos and total mayhem and I guess the sort of working title I want to call this uh, interview review is 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 a tale of two creative cultures pun on two cities. And, and I think it's about when design and TV collide, because I feel the whole experience of working with you and you with all of us as, as uh, makers was that we all went into this thinking, oh, we're the creatives here. They're, they're going to like shut up and follow, you know, not I'm being slightly flippant. Of course, there was more respect than that. But what happened was that we both actually discovered each other's creative nuances, subtleties, the things that mattered. And I think that was mm. what that was what made it for me so um, satisfying. Aside from how incredible the projects were, but it was just an incredible creative journey working with you and the team. Yeah, it was, and it completely changed. I mean, in a way, we were two careers that would probably never meet, right? And I think it completely changed the way that I direct, even the way I direct now and wow. subsequent documentaries. I think it it completely opened my eyes to a different process because often I think when you are directing, you turn up with a crew and you've set up your day and you carry a script and people generally in the main do what you ask them to do. And because you hold the power and the knowledge and, the, and it's not an even playing field. So you've got to be quite knowledgeable and quite ballsy to stand up and go, well, I'm not going to say this or I'm not going to stand there. Or, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> But when I met you lot, <laughs> I, I, I remember just thinking, A, you're talking in a language I don't understand at the moment. And I remember that from week one with a notepad going, okay, iterations and prototypes and like, and, and speaking in code. I thought, wow, I'm going to have to learn this from the beginning. Um, and also because you guys learned so quickly and became so au fait with our language, you all, re you all knew what was going on. Um, much more so than often you do when you're working with, I mean, with standard people you film, I and mean, we call them contributors, but you know, I mean, they're just, they're, they can be experts in their field, but they don't normally interrogate your process <laughs> as much as you guys. <laughs> and I love the way that, that you use like, the yeah, word interrogate. As you guys <laughs> yeah. It was an interrogation. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, great, sorry. Right? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But but I, I think I think you knew like deep down, and I think we all knew is that I guess a hallmark of most good designers is that they're just unstoppably curious. And so it wasn't that we were wanting to like actually be disrespectful or challenge any of you guys. It's that we just were like a total thirst to understand what you were trying to achieve. And I think in a modest way we that had made all... it a better film series. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think in a Much modest way, series. we had always tried to sort of communicate our projects to the best of our ability. And so we knew that you were ultimately just trying to do that. And so I think that yeah. was what made it exciting. Um, but yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I think what you guys did for me as well was interrogate it to say, OK, well, there's this piece of technology or why don't we film it in that way or why don't we do this? And and I have clearly already sat with a blank bit of paper and gone, OK, this is how I see this series looking. And then I really, and I love this and I know different people 
direct in different ways but i love it when people come back and go oh i don't think you should do it like that i think you should do it like this so what we did spend a lot and i think probably why we all became friends you know was that we spent a lot of time interrogating what we were doing off camera as well mm. uh, and that became really enjoyable because then when i we gave everybody a diary camera and uh that became such an integral part of a series because you guys were free to do whatever you wanted and record things and film them in whichever way you wanted. And I had no control over that. And I was fine with that. No, I was fine with that. I was fine with it. <laughs> but but I, remember you, I remember you talking about the process with diary cams, and I hope I'm not um, revealing too much of the, 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 the secret seven spices or any of that sort of stuff, but would it be fair to say that you hope the diary cams would be good otherwise I mean you wouldn't have commissioned them right but but I remember you saying it did exceed your expectations by the time you got it back into the edit amazingly because you, you end up with 20 hours of somebody who is being them at home and they are talking to you because it's you and I, I could feel it like they were talking to to me and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do next. And I oh, don't do that bit. Or, I might do this bit. And then, ow, I've burnt my fingers or, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Or, and so suddenly you've just got this beautiful moment of it's humanity, right? Like often telly, we, we cut off all the fat, right? Because you just want to get to the point really quickly and answer the question. But actually the faff around it is beautiful. And the faff around it is what, Jude, is what makes you, you, right? And so people will like you because... They're watching that and going, oh God, you know, and the stuff you guys do, were doing it was superhuman and was fantastic, but you didn't want to see you being superhuman all the time, right? You want to see you on a journey in a battle, you know, and I think, yeah, and that's, yeah, I think that's what the diary cameras give you. Well, I guess it's like that meme of uh, like Instagram photos where they have a, a little section which is perfect and then like chaos and madness you know, usually like some cupcakes, which look beautiful, and then like a destroyed kitchen <laughs> with a child that is like, you know, bleeding on the floor or something. And I kind of felt like you, you were able to reveal the fact that actually designers are, I mean, everything about design is resilience through the mistakes and, and, and like completely flying by the seat of your pants. Like, I think it's, it's worth saying for the record as well, uh, and please back me up on this, at no point did you say, hey, guys, so uh, go away, work on it, figure out how to do it, and then we'll pretend like you're uh, having a Jeopardy moment. Like, we did not know how to fix that thing on day one. Yeah. That was that was real. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't realise how real that was. <laughs> I think the first time I was like, oh, right, no, you really don't know. And everyone was like, well, no, we don't know. What, what do you think we should do? I was like, don't ask me that. I'm the telly person. I don't, I'm not supposed to know. And then suddenly you realise that you start thinking in that way and go, well, actually, I do have an idea. You could try X, Y, Z. Or, and I think that's, a, yeah, we didn't know. And I think that was the beauty of it because it was, it was pretty scary because we weren't designing for inanimate objects. We were designing for people, a lot of whom were quite ill and you had to get it right and there are laws about it and we were broadcasting it on the BBC for millions of people to watch and that people would scrutinise it and so I think there was a lot of fear um, and a lot of unknown about the legalities about the process about the protocols about all of that kind of stuff I think there was also a whole sense that that there wasn't really a format of a show that really was like it so we couldn't kind of just sneak off and watch I don't know, wife swap and go well I think maybe uh, <laughs> about 28 minutes in maybe we should do that like you, we were just like well I don't know let's just keep shooting it and see where where it ends up and I think that was made the edit incredibly hard but enjoyable you know I mean, yeah, I mean, I remember you you saying that um, the, the, a technical term for anyone doesn't know the ingest uh, which is taking all the footage from all the cards. <laughs> I think you said it sort of almost brought the uh, editing company to its knees and they had to get extra storage. So. Totally. Yeah, there was a couple of fairly uncomfortable chats with the people that were holding onto the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. But, but I fascinating. mean, how, how... So do you mind me sort of just stepping back a minute? I mean, just, just to quickly say for anyone who hasn't seen it, that uh, Big Life Fix was... 
uh, a program about helping people overcome various adversities or disabilities uh, by not always using technology, but but considering it in the process to to help with the solution. But it's fair to say that most of it, the reason people love the show, I think, I think you'd agree, is that the technology was interesting, but the emotional journey, the 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 the, the way that the show was put together and edited was extraordinary. And I think that was the thing that almost overtook the, should we say, the design alone. Um, so I just wondered, I guess my question is, how did you how did you craft what is called a format in the industry? You know, yeah. how did you you shape that brief? I think what we did at the beginning was that we all sat down and said, well, what's the process? And you guys very calmly and nicely over a lots of hours said okay this is the design process and these are the stages you go through so i wrote them down and then you sort of write your act three act structure next to it and go okay well which one fits in which box and where are the jeopardy points where is the drama is the drama the first moment that you have a sort of brain wave you know and start scribbling on a pad is it when you've done your first prototype and it doesn't work like at what point do we need to be there and actually what was interesting was that the answer was you need to be there all the all the time <laughs> because you don't know where that's going to be and that was where the diary cameras came in I was like well I clearly can't be sitting in your front room for the next nine months uh, and and I think that was so that's what you do you absolutely interrogate and learn the process of what you're going to film you work out where those pitch points are and then you look at your hour long show and say, okay, this is where I'm going to be hitting these points. This mm. is where Jude is going to do this design. Will it work? Won't it work? We don't know yet. So camera's here. Then the next bit is, is everyone going to agree with his decision mm. uh, from a design principle, from an ethical principle, from a moral principle? Don't know yet. So we need to have cameras there. The first time that he meets them, are they going to get on? Will he buy into the vision? What's he going to discover about James, for example, that he thought he knew from a five-minute video and then subsequently realises that he didn't and he got it wrong? Yeah. So it's all the, all the time you're... And you're not sort of hunting in a kind of TV producer way to try and find the drama. You're just naturally going, what's the moment that I would go, oh, yeah, I don't know what to do now. You know, and, that's, and that's where you... That, that's sort of how we planned it. Um, there is another layer, I'm sorry, because I can talk about this all day, but there is another layer, which is the subject matter is incredibly complicated and you're trying to hit a 2 million viewing audience from around the UK. So you can't kick off at that time slot on BBC Two with the complicated world and language of engineering because you're going to lose everyone within five minutes. So how? what do you need to explain what engineering was. And the beauty, I think, by the time we went into the end edit, it wasn't a story about engineering, as you just said. It's a story about people. And what I realised that what design and engineering was, wasn't guys with sort of junior hacksaws and white jackets <laughs> and sort of exploding stuff. It was just humans going, that guy over there is not very well, and I've got the capability to try and help him. And I hope to Christ I get it right. And that's what the story was. It was, I, I love watching you guys sort of uh, take huge saws and burn stuff. You know, it's great. Like, but it wasn't, and at first, before I met you all, that's kind of what I thought it was going to be like. I thought it was a bit mm. bang goes the theory, but it wasn't. It was, it was just about people. And I think that's what makes, made it work. And I mean, I guess it's interesting to sort of think, can you, can you talk a little bit about, uh, other formats because I think that's that's really quite interesting for anyone who hasn't seen into TVs. Could you sort of walk walk us through a little bit what the commissioning process is because that's really quite alien to say the design industry of how you tender for something to exist in this world. Yeah, um, the process is um, that you will talk about <clears throat> an area that you're interested in. You might be given a steer from a channel to say, well, you want to do something on engineering. So you'll go away and think about different areas and then you'll say, 
I'll write one page on it and then I'll ring the commissioner or I'll email him or her and say, what do you think of this? And they'll give you a yay or nay. 99% of the time it's a no. Uh, but the 1% of the time they go, okay, yeah, this is quite interesting work this one up. And then you'll go through that process and go. And I would say the guys at Studio Lambert who made it were brilliant and they did their development uh, process that I'm describing. Um, and they will then begin to work it up. They'll think about characters. They'll think about the type of conditions you might want to try and help. They'll think about uh, how you might block out an hour show. It doesn't mean you'll stick to it, but it just it gives it shape and mm. uh, and people call it story beats, but it keeps you the elements of the story, uh, so you understand what you're what you're uh, making. But also, so a channel knows what they're paying for. Essentially, you can't go in and be sort of have a kind of ethereal view about. You know, I think I'm just going to do something. Oh, sorry, my phone was going. But the um, yeah. So I think that's the key. So you you. You're starting with a thought, you're writing a paragraph, one page, you're thinking about a clever title, you're thinking about characters, that one page becomes 10, becomes 20, and then you're submitting it and saying, is this something you want? And then they want to attach directors, then they want to start thinking about uh, who's going to be essentially presenting it, which was Simon Reeve, uh, who are the experts, you and the rest of the team, and then you're then it starts to take a real shape and you're and then it's my job to put together that team and say okay i need a science person and i need a story person i want one of the assistant producers to be absolutely an engineering expert because they need to translate what you just told me and i need someone else to be a story producer because i want them to be thinking i don't i'm not interested in the technicality i'm only interested in the fact that Jude has got these 10 story beats to get through and which one of those is the most exciting. That makes sense. So you, that's, you, then you've got a complete sort of picture. It's, 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 exactly, it's exactly how you do your design. <laughs> Is, well, this yeah, is, which is this what is the, I remember. Yeah. Exactly where the nice point that it was bringing me to was that I guess uh, it's actually a little unusual that you didn't do a pilot, which I guess, you know, in design land would be a sort of first... Uh, what you might call an MVP, a minimum viable product, where people, you know, ultimately tear it apart and it will ultimately evolve into something else and then try again. But but you just you just went straight for this. So could you describe? You a might bit make what... a sizzle. You might mm. make. I mean, so it, it it's often budget dependent as well. Um, yeah. If you if if you're making a whopping great big Amazon one strange rock you're probably going to do a, a pilot. <laughs> you're paying for Will Smith and, and kind of 800 cameramen. So I think that's the, you, you would probably, you would do it then. But yeah, we didn't, we didn't, which was amazing actually, because it is a new, it was a new format. And yeah, and it was riddled with sort of exciting issues to overcome. And, and I guess um, it's one of those things where I sort of think that, you know, it was, it was, it was odd when I look back at it, that, that, this coming together of two different creative disciplines, as I said before. But I was wondering, could you could you break down a little bit sort of where that's taken you in the next steps of your career? Because you've done some amazing stuff. Um, and I know you've yeah. mentioned that some of it, you know, followed through as a thin, thin red thread, shall we say? Yeah, I think look, I mean honestly, I think it I think it was the best. Yeah, I can say say it was the best thing that I'd ever made and still is uh, uh, because it was so hard, but it had, <laughs> it had such a value. And I think in a way, when you're allowed to sort of parachute into somebody else's world, i.e. the world of design and engineering and what you can do, you take away what the best bits and you take away the pieces of advice and you take away the experiences that you have. And I think over two years plus or whatever that we made the first and second series of Big Life Fix, it was just remarkable. You know, it was remarkable the people that we worked with. You think mm. about half of the characters. I mean, they were people who were going through incredible hardship 
and our and the sole job, irrespective of the telly, the sole job became how do you design something? It just makes life a little bit better. Mm. And that and was I, a really wonderful thing. And, and I think it's 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 always been interesting to think that the there was a lot of work that happened before the cameras had to roll. But there's also a lot of work that continued afterwards. And, you know, we called that yes. sort of af- aftercare and maintenance. And I think in many ways that that felt very normal in a design world that, you know, even to, you know, not, not to make it sound on the same level uh, as pedestrian as this, but, you know, if you make something at Dyson, you have to make sure you have spares and accessories for five years or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Don't quote me on that figure, but, uh, but a substantial amount of time to say that we'll still help that, person who's bought that product and so we yeah. ended up sort of working with remap which was a really great mm. organization um and, and again it's well, they are it, great. it's it's so little known as well that uh, for anyone who doesn't know it's basically remap uh, pairs together people who have a, a need or something that they would like improved in their life um quite often with retired engineers who just have that spare time but also years of experience and they put together various solutions. So in many ways, we were a, were a younger version and, and perhaps, should we say, more t- technologically savvy, I don't think would be rude to say to Remap, uh, as I think that was their words reflecting on us as well. And I think what's been nice is the effect, and maybe this is an interesting thing to discuss with you. I know when speaking to some of the people at Remap, they said, well, you know, in some ways, your projects have made us realise that there's incredible wealth in experience, but we also sometimes need a younger generation to bring in things like, you know, computing and code mm. and app design and things like this. So I think, mm. actually, I never would have predicted it, but actually Big Life Fix sort of ended up creating these sort of, uh, you know, impact on other organisations, which has been extraordinary to consider. Yeah. That's, a, do you know what, when you're, it totally did. And when you're making a show, the dream of making a show is that it has a wider reach than the one hour that it is on telly, mm. right? Because you, you're investing nine months of your life. It's going to be on for one hour and then it's basically going to get forgotten. And so when you're eight months later still working with Great Ormond Street to run prototype trials and or when you're working with Remap and when you're changing, I think we were doing stuff with, we did a children in need special, didn't we? And then yeah. open university and all that. I mean, then you think something grows arms and legs and it has a total value. And that's the joy of, I mean, I'd probably say that that's why most people want to get into making documentaries is, is to sort of highlight an, an issue or make a difference in some way or another. And I think, I, I, I do think this, that Big Life Fix was a totally distilled and brilliant version of that. It's, I mean, look, it still has, it still has legs now, right? Like, yeah. And that's, it's amazing that people, especially in your world, will still reference it. And it's, you know. Well, and, all... and dare, dare I say it sort of, it seems like it's sort of really become embedded into a lot of the sort of teaching communities. Um, mm. I think a month doesn't go by where I get a comment from some, some teacher a, d- a design and technology mm. teacher somewhere going, uh, you know, high five, just use your videos to, to help structure a lesson plan. And right, right. We, we never anticipated that, but it's just, it's so lovely to get those. Um, and I appreciate I've got a little bit of social media presence and a YouTube channel on modelling, so I, I'm sure I get it, but I know a lot of the other team do as well for just, you know, also asking for follow-ups and can I get it? And I think one of the nice things mm. we did was to open source as much of the work as possible. We even went yeah. through quite a, a tricky negotiation of, you know, do we patent stuff or, or do we, mm-hmm. do we accept that? Was the, wasn't it? And that was a real, a real moral maze because on the one hand, you might think, oh, of course you wouldn't patent. But then actually there's some arguments that if you don't patent at all, it means that uh, you, you're not able to commercialise the thing at scale because yeah. the company who is responsible for commercialising said thing needs to basically yeah, why would I bother? Yeah. recruit its investment. So all of that stuff we just did not expect. And then as you, as you touched on medical device design, um, I can't speak for everyone, so forgive me if I offend someone's pedigree, but I know that Ryan was certainly one of the most experienced people in medical device design. 
Um, mm. And obviously I'd done a, a very small amount with the NHS in, in contrast to him. But even just bringing that, that almost permeated almost every single episode was a much higher level of, of awareness and, you know, considering the failure modes and the ethics. I mean, that, and I think one of the things which I'd love to hear your thoughts on is that you quite literally could not include all of that in the show because it was epic, <laughs> epic stuff. It was, <laughs> and, and sometimes that was utterly infuriating that some of the biggest, the biggest dramas were so complicated that you just couldn't distill it down. And I, I would come back and say to Kat, my wife, I'd be like, and then the maddest thing happened. And then I'm five minutes later, still trying to explain the complications of the legalities before the thing is, I've even explained what happened. And then you can see them sort of going, oh, okay, I don't understand what you're talking about. So we all lived in this little bubble. Like, well, there were 12 of us or with, all the, with, uh, with all our team and your team. Um, and I think we all lived in this bubble where, where we were just on this adventure together, you know, with this language, with all these issues. And I don't think a lot of them did make the final, the final mm. show. Yeah, I, mean, I think it was. It, it, I guess yeah. can I can I mention one of the people who we spoke to with James, of a yeah, photographic yeah, yeah. background? Yeah. So so basically, yeah. I mean, we even got in touch with Giles Julie. Um, was amazing. Who, who was extraordinary, and that never made the edit. Um, and I mean, that was just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Giles had basically covered all sorts of uh, extraordinary experiences in war torn countries um, a- until he had a, a, a tragic accident where he was hit by a, an is it an improvised exploded device, explosive device, yeah. um, and and he lost the use of uh, well lost. Uh, part of both his legs and part of one of his arms. And yet he recovered, went out with various prosthetics to help his to help his legs so he could walk around. And he still continued being a photographer in the in exactly the same type of situations. And one of the most yeah. extraordinary things he said to James, and I think this is one of these things where dare I say it, you know, please don't take me out of context and take me in the in the, the fullness of this discussion with you. But it was one of those things where I remember I almost felt Giles was able to say certain things because of his disability to Mm. James that were so real and sometimes so blunt that I don't think you or me would have ever felt we had license to say uh, and get away with it. I mean, I guess it's yeah, like the way they, absolutely. you know, Dave Chappelle always jokes about saying, you know, I'm I'm allowed to use the 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 N word because I'm black, but then he gets into this whole thing of pulling that apart and saying how ridiculous it is. I'm not going to go down that route, but the, the it's one of those interesting things of that we do censor ourselves, and that I found it extraordinary that that James was able to still roll with those punches, even though he was mm-hmm. in a a truly unbelievably horrid situation and yet he still took so much inspiration i think to to bring it back to the point is that giles was saying look i i basically go out into the fields i pack a camera and i pack maybe two lenses and the camera doesn't have all the bells and whistles and 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 amazingly he can actually change a, a lens uh despite his his impairment um and I think it just really brought it home to James that everything that Giles was saying that was was about being real with the people he was taking photos with and being there. And I remember one yeah. thing really stuck with me. He said, if I have an hour, I will probably spend 50 minutes trying to get to know the person and 10 minutes mm. probably shooting. And I just thought, God, yeah. what a ratio, right? And I mean, that that sort of had parity with a lot of what you were trying to do, I felt of going, we can just go in cameras blazing, but it doesn't work, you know. It doesn't ever work. And I think that's the, I mean, if you're trying to make those, do you know what, people never underestimate, you should never underestimate the intelligence of your audience. And I think that's the thing that sometimes people do because they're, they're restricted by money. I mean, if you want to make a documentary, the dream would be that you would just keep turning the cameras over for five years. 
and uh, because that's you're going to get the best stuff. So those brilliant. I, I mean, I've worked with an amazing American director called Marcus, who has spent twenty years uh, filming the rebuilding of uh, um, of uh, Ground Zero. And every day, or uh, I mean, for twenty years, not every day, but for a long time, he's been filming the same characters and the same building process, and it's amazing. And he is an amazing director, and but he's he's an artist as well, and he's invested in that process. And you, when you're in the edit and you're watching something, you'll shoot for a week and be like, yeah, okay, it's fine. And then it'll just be one thing or you guys will deliver it to us on a diary camera. And you go, there it is. Like, let's build the scene around that because that's mm. the thing. And, and an audience will watch it and go, oh, that's just contrived nonsense or that's really real or, you know, and I think that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of the process that we had is that you couldn't shoot this quickly because it doesn't take two months to build the designs that you built for the people mm. that you did. So we knew that. Uh, and, and actually, to be honest, that was the Achilles heel of our series. Like, people wanted to make it again, but it was prohibitively expensive. Uh, and it used an enormous amount of time and emotional energy from everybody. So you couldn't keep doing it. But I think there's, yeah, I think there's, I think I'm, I'm sort of going off on a tangent, but I think that was the beauty. That was the beauty of it, was that you have the balance of, true emotion incredibly difficult stories about very upsetting subjects sometimes and then just an absolute drive and will to try and help in any way that you can and you put all that on the screen i think it's it that's why it worked yeah so i guess i guess i'm just trying to think one of the things that strikes me is that it feels like every generation you know, finds finds a different voice and a different thing it mm. wants to communicate or interrogate or expand upon. Um, and I think documenting is such an interesting art because it's it's both a combination of factual but storytelling and how you shape it and communicate it mm. to someone who isn't inside your head or your world or your indeed your culture, your country, whatever experience. And so I guess I was curious to know a little bit, like, where do you think the industry is going because I mean I guess you know you talked about small things like uh, I remember we were discussing previously like I said you know South Park famously is six days to air you know every episode they they blast through it and then conversely the film Boyhood uh, forgive me I forget the director uh, is it Linklater I want to say but but he filmed that over like 15 mm. years um, mm. and and so you've got those sorts of things you've got things shot on iPhone, you've got things shot on GoPro, on, on drones. And so it's just yeah. like, at the end of the day, the technology is interesting, but it's nothing if it doesn't speak to the humanity, I feel. And so totally. if it's not, where, where do you think totally. it's going? <laughs> I, think, I think it's polarized. Like, I think there's something brilliant about UGC, about user-generated content, about the people's ability to film stuff on their phones and stick it up online because you can't film everything in, and the fact that a phone is as small as it is now uh, and you no longer need a massive sort of 20 kilo camera to get the things that you, you know, I, that's amazing. It's utterly amazing and I, I, and I hope in a way that that makes documentary making easier, more accessible. Um, because it is an expensive process and also more real because when someone walks up to you with a great big 20 kilo box on their shoulder, you're not going to behave in the same way as if someone's just carrying a phone and, you know, and I think that's, so I, there is one side of documentary making that is going down that UGC content. Um, and that's really, really interesting. There is another side that is going even bigger, area mirrors and huge budgets and I think I've talked about One Strange Rock before but I mean like epic uh, documentaries on a scale that didn't exist mm. Blue Planet 2 for example stuff like that and so I think they're polarising and I think people are less um, 
prepared to sit through stuff that's mediocre. I think the SVOS, so the rise of Netflix and Amazon and Nat Geo and all of those have changed the landscape. So it makes it, it makes everyone sit up and take notice. So uh, three identical strangers don't f with cats. Uh, all these shows that are on at the moment, they yeah. have changed because suddenly you're like, well, okay, yeah, it's a true story, yeah, it's a documentary, but if I thought about it like a drama script, what would it? How would that play out? You know, mm. Am I allowed to play with the audience? The definition of a documentary and how we shoot it has changed um, and it will carry on changing. And I think that's quite intriguing. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could say that even the sort of the, the, the documentary narrative awareness has even permeated things like podcasts. I mean, you know, Serial was one of the biggest. And then I, I don't know how big it was, but, but BBC Sounds did, uh, was it the tale of the lost uh, crypto queen i forgot what it was but yeah, basically yeah, yeah. the the woman behind one coin who did a runner sorry just spoiled it for everyone there uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was the pursuit of the journalists uh, <laughs> uh trying to yeah. basically track her down and i won't say whether they did find her or not but but that was what was so interesting is they scripted it the way you would they they observed the beats and they said look we've we've shot all this oh, sorry we've we've recorded all this tape uh you know, how do we how do we put it together in a way that that it's it's fun to listen mm. to, and again, it, it's it's sympathetic to it. it's it not from perfect audio. Mm. And I think there's, I mean, look, there are some editors, and everybody we will discuss what's the best way of cutting a film. And some people turn all the screens off, and and uh, or if you're in a viewing, your first viewing of a rough cut, so when you know it's over long and it's a bit baggy, but you're trying to make sure it makes sense, you don't even look at it. You know, you turn your chair around and just listen. Like, does the story make sense when your eyes are closed? And then huh. picture it up. You know, I, I think there's, we learn a hell of a lot from, from radio documentaries and podcasts and stuff because there's an art form there because you've got to convey a point without pictures. Um, and sometimes you can be a bit lazy in your storytelling if you've got fantastic, uh, fantastic images. And mm. so I won't, I won't name them, but there are documentaries that cost an arm and a leg, you know, and they look absolutely amazing. But you just go, I can't quite work out what the story is. And then you realise there wasn't one because <laughs> they spent ages trying to get somewhere to film something without actually remembering what it, why it was they were there at all. Yeah, it's, a, yeah it's, it's intriguing. So I think, so I, I didn't really give you an answer on what the, what the future of documentary making well, is. I, hope I guess there is no sensible. future, but... But what do you, what do you, I'll frame it the other way. Never mind what you think is the future, but what is it that you wish there was more of? And why? And what's holding it back? Honestly, I think I wish there was more of people picking up cameras and just filming their own stories. I think you don't need to go to film school. You don't need to... You don't need to have a £20,000 camera. I think you can just go and tell a story and really amazing stories are just that. And they can be shot on a phone and they can be wobbly as hell and they can be in and out of focus, but if something is incredible, it's incredible. So I, I wish there was more of that. And in a way, to sort of take away the pomposity uh, and hierarchies that exist within documentary making because it, it doesn't need to, it is as you described it is you're documenting like it, you can document anything you like and tell it in any way you want you, you don't have to conform to to rules or you know and, and we we are in a you know, i don't think it's any any secret that you look at the people that are making documentaries and predominantly you know they're they're me they're, they're white middle class men uh, who are making films about everything in the world? You go well. Let, let that person make a film about their own community. What what gave him the right to turn up with his sort of air of authority and his posh camera equipment? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but I mean I guess that I guess that's sort of um, I mean don't get me wrong I, I I'd, I'd still take this comment with a pinch of salt. But but I think I grew up on on Vice as in Vice the magazine yeah, Vice dot com, yeah. and and I feel they've evolved in some really interesting ways of perhaps that point of they've definitely given the mic the camera the the 
the pen, as it were, to all sorts of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And I, I'm sure if you wanted to be snarky, you could say that it's a certain group with a certain vibe and a dynamic. I, I'm sure they'd accept that. But it, but it's definitely not, should we say, the institution. It's pretty fair to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is brilliant. And some of the Vice stuff, I think they're co-praying stuff or acquisitions on Channel 4 as well. I mean, it's really good. It's really yeah. well made. And, and I think it's, and it's utterly fascinating because there are moments where it's, yeah, that you just, you're going to places that you would never otherwise go. Um, and it's not, and I, by that I don't mean the location, like, oh, well, you're in Afghanistan or you're, I mean, the, the sort of environment and the position that the person talking to you is in, that they just yeah. would never be if you turned up normally. They just wouldn't behave like that or they wouldn't tell you those things or they wouldn't share that information. And I think that's well, really, really intriguing. And, and it's weird because without getting too meta about this, I, I know from just interviewing someone else, and this isn't to put you off your step now, but as oh, interviewing on. someone else, and they, <laughs> yeah. they just said, actually, I kind of, you know, when I've been interviewed before with a big, huge microphone in front of me, I just clam up and I freak out. And they said, oh, it's really lovely talking to you. It was just on Zoom as we are now. And they said, oh, it just felt like a normal conversation. And I said, oh, yeah, you got to be careful you don't say anything stupid that you regret. You know, and they laughed and you could tell they were like, oh, yeah, just mm. playing back the moment. But actually, there's something disarming about the fact that we can see each other and, you know, dare I say, the mic isn't a big, woolly, foam, domed, whatever it is, right in front of us. And, and, and as you said earlier, that not having £20 of stuff on your shoulder, people do mm. behave differently, even if they are fully aware they're being recorded. Yeah. There's, some, there's something that losing the glass really helps. And so I... Mm. I guess within that, I kind of wonder, There's, there's got to be something kind of interesting that you think, there's, how, how do people manage this thing of, they, people, people crave candor, I guess is what I'm saying, but then mm. if anybody slips up, we're incredibly reproachful and, and, and sort of ov overly yes. critical. And, and, and I sort of sometimes do sympathise with politicians. I know that seems a, a, a weird thing to say given the certain circumstances. <laughs> but, but honestly, if you try and walk even a minute in their shoes and you go, God, you, you literally can't say anything right given the situation. Then, Nothing you say with words. It is all just down to yeah. actions and can you actually do anything at all? And so yeah. I kind of feel that do, do you think actually the sort of documentary thing will actually, rather than sort of giving the camera necessarily to like different f sort of segments of society, would it actually invade different institutions and say, we desperately need, you know, it, it's not to say that you want, I, I think I think there's a danger of giving too much information. I, I'm not, it's not that I'm a conspiracy theorist or anything, but I, I do actually believe certain mm. things aren't suitable for public, just in the same way that I don't show yeah. my toddler certain graphic movies because he just can't yeah. comprehend it. And it's not about being patronising, it's just saying you simply have not put the time in to know how to process that. But I do wonder mm. whether the only way we get better is exposure, it is failure, it is things hurting a little, and we come out the other side understanding it and having more empathy, so... Yeah, I think so. I think it's that. I think it's a, as a filmmaker, the process of making bad films is really painful, <laughs> you know? It's, it's like when you, you're making a prototype that doesn't work. You sit there and go, oh, God, and not only is it not very good, I just showed it to half of Britain and they all thought it wasn't very good and someone wrote about it in the paper and said it wasn't very good. I'm like, now I'm going for a windy walk on my own, you know. And, <laughs> it's, and it is, and then you do sort of, you think you're getting better, but it's all, a lot of it is subjective because it's not, it's a piece of kit that, it, like you when you're doing your design, it's a piece of kit that needs to work for a certain person and it'll work for one person and it'll absolutely not for another. And I think tele shows and documentaries do exactly the same thing. Um, it is intriguing. Yeah, I think that's, that's the joy of, I think, doing anything creative, whether you're building something or making something, is that you're putting your heart into it and 
there is a painful moment where other people will criticise, but you just carry on, don't you, and sort of dust yourself off and go, okay, well, look, I'm going to... I'm going to... Uh... The first film that I made was about <laughs> a group of dwarves, a group of dwarves <laughs> in Bollywood, and I thought it was the obviously. most important... <laughs> obviously. Well, we'd moved... I'd moved out to India with Kat, and we were living in Bombay, in Mumbai, and we were making this... Uh, film. It was on a film set, a Malayalam film set called Alba de Dweep. And uh, I was there and filming all of these dwarves. And I was like, this is a disability film. And my God, if, it, if I'm going to do anything, this is going to make a difference, right? So I bring it back to the UK and the level of smirking and laughing of sort of my awfully sort of authoritative quasi BBC voiceover over a load of Indian dwarves dressed up as warriors on ponies on a film set they were just like what on earth is this random sort of weird film and no we will never put it on tv and i was like okay so i took it away and i've still got the dvd because i went, i refused to go to it um but yeah i remember being pretty <laughs> well, hurt they, for quite a they, while but yeah. forgive, forgive me but you have to explain that because af after you've just basically uh berated yourself for being uh, you know a white middle class guy uh, yeah, yeah. That was that was the last thing I would have predicted was your was your was your debut entry. I was like, what? <laughs> so so where did yeah, you find did. yourself sitting in a pub going, uh, yes, people of diminutive stature in India, That's lock and load guys. <laughs> <laughs> when when really, really, how did you find yourself there? <laughs> how do you find, um, so we wanted to go to India. I mean, my I've got like a sort of Yorkshire. Yorkshire and Scottish descent dad, but my mum's Indian. Um, and people would look at you and go, and go okay, that's not that. So, um, and she grew up in, uh, or was born in, uh, I mean, pre partition uh, um, India, but now Pakistan in Lahore, and then uh, moved to Delhi and then over to the New York and, New York and then London. And then, um, and uh, so I always wanted to go and investigate that world because it's where my you know, grandparents and I've got uncles and all that. So I remember going over there, getting a job on various, um, at various production companies in Mumbai. And then this story coming up and I was making document, uh, working on a documentary strand called One Life on BBC One. And they said, oh, uh, this could be one for them. So I rang up, uh, uh, and I remember speaking in one of those uh, phone booths to a Brilliant guy, a guy called Todd Austin, said, look, I've got this idea. You know, could you give us a bit of money? And he was like, it just sounds freaking crazy. Have a grand or whatever. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm going to make my, <laughs> make my film. And my poor now wife, girlfriend at the time, says she would do sound, has no interest in making documentaries with. Uh, and so we spent, yeah, about six months, seven months making this thing. Um, I would love to go back, like knowing what I know 20 years later now, go back and make that film again. I'd make it really well. And I keep wow. thinking about that maybe one day I would. Because it's the, the, the basic tenets of it being a film about disability, but it's a film about rights and it's a film about love and finding love. It's all these things. And it's wow. a film about a huge film industry. But uh, yeah just badly executed by a 23 year old <laughs> so yeah oh man I, I kind of want you to riff on on the whole thing about uh, Bollywood because I kind of feel I was late to the Bollywood world but I um I one of my one of my teen mates was uh uh Indian and um Portuguese mix what? um and 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 she was like oh best film ever for, for you as a sort of entry level, not not being condescending, but just being like, yeah, as someone who hasn't even been to India, uh, go check out Three Idiots. And I've right, yeah, seen yeah. that. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, and, and also because she knew I was a bit of a nerd and into making and building and engineering and stuff. So it's like the perfect combination of like yeah. enough, enough sort of like stereotypes that you get it, but actually then you watch it a second or a third or a fourth time because it is hilarious. And then you start mm. to read and realise, all right, I get that this is an oversimplification, but that's an interesting portrait of a, of a, of a sort of social point that needed to be made. And then you start yeah. looking at the rest of uh, Khan's catalogue and it's just quite extraordinary. And you realise, hold on, this is someone at like the, 
the peak of their career, who's making mm. a film about uh, two two daughters wrestling. Uh, yeah. When when it's just you know, of course, in in the UK, you're like, oh, cool, that's 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 kind of rock and roll, and you go, no, that's like social suicide to 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 thrust two girls who should be respectable housewives or whatever, and so he just mm. runs through that whole thing, and for him. I find it extraordinary some of the things that you have to recontextualize and you think the risks that he is taking with his career to make stuff which, you know, in the West seems just basic. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, and so I guess to bring the question back, like, how is it you manage the situation when you have a career, when you have a pedigree and you think, mm -hmm. I'm going to do something where everyone could turn on me and this could go horrifically wrong for me? God, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, I think, in a way, I probably played, not played it safe-ish, but my, so the last two films, well, one was about, uh, it was for the BBC, and it was called Meat, a Threat to Our Planet, and it was taking on uh, the world's meat industry and, you know, the... British Cattlemen's Association, uh, sorry, American Cattlemen's Association, National Farmers Union definitely stuck it to me uh, in the complaints and everything afterwards. And they thought, well, okay. But I think there's that sort of level where I want to highlight an issue. And I think that's what yeah. we did in Big Life Fix. It's something else called Drowning in Plastic. We did the same thing. It's, it's quite an easy thing. You're always going to get people who are going to say, yeah, go you, because you're, hmm. you're using the documentary form to say this is not right we need to do something about it so you're confined i think the people that will that are really ballsy are the people that sort of turn the camera on themselves or their families or their you know i've never managed to do that no and i think there's because i think there's a lot of people as well who will really like they will make films and just eat baked beans and they don't want any money and they're gonna make that thing the sort of most rugged and raw and terrifying film you've ever seen i'm not that man like i sort of <laughs> i think i wanted to be i think probably the that film about indian dwarfs turned me off it completely i think i, think I just was like hold on i just want to I, I want a job making documentaries where someone's going to give me some money for them um i think yeah there is a breed of there's a breed of filmmaker that are hardcore and they're amazing you know they're well, I mean, you, you, you also worked with uh, uh, Jamie, who, you know, yeah, was yeah, a, yeah. Is it, is it assistant producer? Forgive me for not knowing my time. No, he wasn't. He was a director. He was a director. director. So Sorry. he was um, he was directing some of the... Sh well, we were sort of splitting the characters, weren't we? As in yeah. each of the stories. But, yeah, but, yeah. But, 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 I mean, he had, done, he had done stuff in sort of, was it 24 Hours in A&E? And yeah. he'd also... Uh, done a documentary. I remember. I think it was called something like sixty hour, sixty days homeless or on the street. Oh, Forgive yeah, me for, yeah, yeah. for which it was years ago on Channel Four. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I guess the the thing I I guess what I'm trying to say is not be one or the other, but one of the things I think is almost interesting as a parallel in the sort of creative world is you you can be a designer who's sort of should we say very provocative and more at the side of I guess what you call artistic. And, and mm. then there's the more sort of functional, I'm happy with a brief and I'll just crack on at the sort of engineering side of the spectrum. So I wonder yes. how how do people find their find their forte? How do they find their what I think best it's, at? I think you, you reinvent yourself over and over again. I think, I totally see I, actually where I was going. I think actually, if I'm honest, I'm sort of slightly selling myself short. I think through your 20s, I think yeah, so you go too. to yeah. Johannesburg <laughs> and you go and do, uh, yeah, I think you go to Johannesburg and like a, and you sit in the tra trauma units at Johannesburg General Hospital and you go do hard stuff in war zones because you've got no kids and you're like, come on, let's, you know, I want to make, I want to make crazy films and go on an adventure. And then you, have children and a mortgage and you're like, okay, now I'm going to be predominantly in the UK because I want to see my children grow up. And then I think you, your children do grow up and they don't want to know you. So then you're like, okay, now I'm going to go back on the road again. And uh, so I'm sort of, I think last year I spent quite a lot of the time or year before lots in rubbish dumps in Indonesia, making a film about plastics. Uh, but I definitely miss the kids. So I was like, okay going to come home again. And I think that's the same with 
design because they want those films at the moment. So I'm going to go and make them. My life to 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 say that I'm probably not going to be as edgy as maybe I'd like to be. Uh, But in three or four years time, they're not going to want those films anymore. And my kids are going to be older. So I'll go off and make a new genre or a new style of programming that I don't know anything about. And and, and would you say there's, there's perhaps also a bit of a knack in, in patience that I think, you know, you always, you always have this sense as if you've got to chase the genre. And it's not to be grandiose and say, oh, just sit there and the world will come to your doorstep. Of course, that's mm. very, very rare that that ever happens. But but I guess it's sort of interesting to think, you know, I, I guess the design industry always talks a lot about side hustles. And of course, those have a bit of a sort of dirty connotation as a distraction. But, but I wonder, do you ever sort of uh i guess in journal uh, sorry not journalism in publishing people sometimes publish mm. under an alias because they want to experiment with something that would be completely incongruous with everything the empire that they just built financially around a certain yeah, reader yeah, base yeah. and so i mean it's quite i mean if i'm trying to think i'm not very well read but at least i know that sort of roald dahl obviously wrote a lot for children's books but he also did a load of really dark i'll use a polite term yes. messed up stuff for adults yeah, yeah, and totally. and and you quite often don't know those two and it's interesting that he kept the name he didn't go under an alias so i mm. wonder is with this new format and this ability to shoot super raw are you ever tempted mm. to say all right i can't go to the congo and nearly get shot at by you know whichever tribe mm. is is in conflict yeah, at the yeah, minute. but yeah. but you can still say look i can test myself with yeah. with different different media, different technology, different people. So I sort yes. of, where do you think that's you going? Can. Yeah, you can. I think it's, I think it's going the way that people want to experiment with style and form, with the visual and the audio tropes. They want to say, mm-hmm. okay, we don't need to make this how. The BBC can you can you can you break it down what you mean by style and form? Because I think it might be interesting oh, yeah. to like. So, so you look at a, you look at a standard TV documentary. Okay, they pretty much look the same, right? We chuck a drone up in the air, you get your big establishing shot, and go, "Welcome to Bradford," and this is what it looks like. And here are your sort of end of the long lens, rather nice shots of people going about their daily business. It doesn't mean you've got to shoot a documentary like that at all. You could do it completely differently. Um, and I think people have, their confidence is growing with people to be able to experiment with that. And I think their confidence is growing with um, broadcasters because they know, outside of YouTube, they know that people don't want to just watch the same thing over and over again, that it isn't s- slot box telly, put everything into a you know format and then just churn it out. Um, albeit those things make money, but they it isn't what everybody wants to watch. So I hope that the future is that people are experimenting more and given more chance to experiment in the way that they do in in the arts. I think a bit more mm. and experimental theatre and and I think that's yeah. If you could take sort of upstairs at the Royal Court and put it on telly do you know what I mean like if you could take <laughs> that sort of stuff and, and give it a platform on on telly I think you'd be in a good place I think I think it's always it's always interesting I mean I, I, I'm not trying to sort of uh, quote the cliche but it is always interesting how art and technology always play this game of influencing one another and I think yeah I, I mean, I, I mean, we used a lot of uh, obviously sort of GoPros and things like this, and, and of course the diary cams. And clearly, the diary cam unlocked something in the format which was sort of there, but but it really reached its full potential. But then I, mm. I think as well, then it creates a format which then goes in a completely different direction. So I really love that, um, you know, that, that this this way that there's always this to and fro with it. And it's it's been amazing talking about this with you. But I guess, is there anything else that you feel... I mean, uh, there's one question I would like to talk to you about, but I don't know whether I'm going down a massive rabbit hole here. No, but I mentioned I mentioned, um, you know, network, uh, the TV, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the film with uh, Howard Beale as the lead character 
who famously yeah. is screaming out his window in this this rage of people's complacence and submission to sort of media yeah. and TV. And so yes, I, I wonder how do you sort of react to that sense that, that that film for me feels almost slightly a sort of echo from the past of saying, mm. where does the responsibility for people like you lie in creating content which you know the masses will, uh, it'll grab their attention. Yes, use that word deliberately, attention. Um, yeah. But it's not necessarily wholesome or sustaining or the right thing. But you know there's a ton of cash. Yeah. But then I think anyone who tries to high road that and say, oh, I would never make a base choice based on money. It's like, yeah. really, you, have you never been employed uh, yeah. or, or had to work for a brief? So, So where do you, I guess the question that I'm trying to ask is, how do you think people will will manage this balance between giving people what they want versus giving people what they need? Oh, that is that is a good question. No, it's an easy question, right? <laughs> because yeah, on the one hand, you've got your own moral compass saying, "I want to make films about things." They give a voice to someone who doesn't have it or to highlight a problem that I think needs changing or a skill that people should have, like big life fix. On the other hand, you go, I've got to get bums on seats to watch this thing. Otherwise, I'm not going to work again. And you look at telly and it's in the main, probably most people leave or get into telly because they want to make, very luckily, the kind of stuff that I'm making. And I think, okay, that's really, really great. But a load of people go into the sort of returnable formats. And by that, I mean shows like Location Location or uh, Extreme Fishing with Robson Green or whatever it might be. Like, and they're brilliant shows and they're hugely entertaining and they have an absolute value. But they're driven by something very different. <laughs> They're driven by finances, economies of scale. How much money do we make if we made 40 of these? It's such a hard question. Like, is it a great question? Because I don't think you, I don't think there is, you have to, in a way, sort of rely on your own moral compass. I think that's, I think, to make the things that you feel comfortable making. Like I struggle like, with some of those formats when you look at things like wife swap or I couldn't do that. Like I would be no good at that. And that doesn't mean that people who did do it are bad by any stretch of imagination, but it just means that I know that I couldn't because I just wouldn't have been any good at it. I would have just been turned red all the time. Every time I was trying to get them to do something they might not have done, I'd be like, I'd just be, uh, yeah. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I haven't answered it, have I? I've just sort of scared. No, and, and I, wasn't, I wasn't necessarily looking for the, for the simple thing because you can, I can turn the question round on myself just as uncomfortably of that, you know, I mean, I, I guess I was always reminded of a, of a question that, uh, one of my tutors was basically proposing, and I won't go through the whole story, but essentially it has the same ramifications of saying, you know, in, in product design, you can do a very worthy thing, and it's very, very hard to make that just perfect timing, and it seizes a generation, and it becomes the new paradigm. But quite mm. often, you're actually working in a company which is, you know, let's say a big fizzy drinks company, and you go, but how do we move them ever so slightly to something that's a little bit healthier? You know, and it's like, it, it, and so you can play a game of like the Che Guevara, we're just going to like get it done and burn it down. And I say this having been to Cuba and even spoke to like some of the younger generation and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's all right wearing all those T-shirts, but the country was in chaos afterwards. So it's like, yeah, viva la revolution, yeah. but you also need the people who rebuild afterwards. So I think it's always, I guess, maybe my answer to the question is it's never usually one movement. It's a combination of succession of things that create the most effective change. 
because you yeah. you do need your you do need your rebels, you do need your your fringe players, the outcasts, but you also need those people who translate it so that the masses get it. I mean, I always have mm. this. I think my wife. Uh, I, I remember watching Brokeback Mountain and thinking, really that. If this was a heterosexual thing, this would be dull as ditch water. And my wife was quite quick to point out. She's like, "Yeah, but I lived in America, and I can tell you that that movie was probably really edgy, and needed to be said." You're right, like, right, right. You're, "You're already cool with all that, so it wasn't aimed at you." And I was like, mm. "Actually, that's a fair point. That was not aimed at me." And so that that always yeah. sticks with me. That point of like, you're not always trying to create change by affecting everyone. It's sometimes you have to work on certain things at certain times in certain ways, and so I guess yeah, yeah, I'm not answering the question either. But I think it is down to the individual, but also I think a lot of it is timing and luck, right? You know, oh, any anyone so who's ever done the big hit, so if they're honest, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it is, and it's and and yeah, why totally, it's down to that. All of it is, and and also that's the thing I think sometimes about directors. You know, people pretend that it's a it's a one man or woman sort of skill. It's the genius in their brain, right? I mean, it's yeah. just not. It's a collective team effort. Like from the moment that you even open your mouth on the first day, like it's just. It's everybody, everybody's opinion chucked into a pot and you choose the best one and you let everybody do the job that they're supposed to do, right? Like that sort of, that kind of authority, yeah, that idea that sort of somehow someone is an in inverted commas a genius or a, you know, a, a, an amazing filmmaker and da da is nonsense. It's, it's the place, it's the time, it's the subject. Uh, and then it's surrounding yourself with other people that you get on with and can do their job really well as well, you know, and then, then you come up with something special. Well, I, I kind of think that would be, yeah. for me, a sort of apt conclusion that ultimately there is no shiny answer and it is about the, the, the hard yeah. one of finding your, your calling but also surrounding yourself with teams that you respect and taking risks when you know not all the time in your career as you said you know i think there's a time for stability with your kids but when you can take a risk yeah. take it taking a safe risk as it were so i think that yeah. i think i think you said it really well and um i think that's a really lovely place to finish and uh, i know we could talk more but i've also oh, conscious dude, that no, we could wrap it we could wrap it all <laughs> night with like there's huge train journeys we used to go on <laughs> indeed indeed yeah, that's brilliant but, no Thank you so much, Tom. It's uh, it's a pleasure and always insightful. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'm sure I'll see you around. Jude, definitely see you around, man. See you soon. All right, then. Take care. Take care. See you later. Bye. Bye, 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 bye.